I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. And then he says, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. He says, such and one caught up to the third heaven. So here Paul is saying that he met somebody, whether through a vision or actually did God put this person in front of him. He's like, I'll ask God when I get there and we'll ask God when we get there as well. But he's saying he saw somebody that was caught up. He saw somebody that was saved and went to heaven, went to the third heaven. What is that? That's the spiritual heaven. That's the heaven that we were all looking forward to when we die physically on this earth. We're going to be caught up to the third heaven. All right, now go back to Revelation chapter 21. So all that to say this, there's three heavens in the Bible. Whenever the Bible uses the word heaven, you have to kind of decide, all right, what's the context of this verse? Which heaven is it talking about? But clearly in second, when it's talking about us dying and being with the Lord, it's talking about this third heaven. Okay, look at Revelation chapter 21 and look at verse number one. So after the millennial reign of Christ, the Bible describes what heaven is going to look like to us, what this new heaven and new earth, this is where we are in Revelation 21 and Revelation 22, after the millennial reign of Christ, after all the things of the end times prophecy have happened, this is where we are going to spend our eternity. Look at verse number one. The Bible says this, and it says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Now, one of the guys asked me, the other kind of took me by surprise a few months ago and asked me, now, do you think that this is, a, a new heaven or and a new earth, or do you think it's kind of like the same earth that's been all kind of fixed up? And I think that now that I've, you know, thought about this, it's, I, I mean, I believe what the Bible says, it's a new heaven and a new earth. It's, it's not like refurbished or anything like that, all right? So um, it's a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more C. So tonight we're talking about the third heaven. We're talking about spiritual heaven, number one. And then number two, we're going to talk about where we will spend eternity in this new heaven and this new earth. All right. Now, I'm going to answer three questions. I'm just going to answer three questions about heaven that people commonly ask. All right. And I'm going to show you what the Bible says, not what some book somebody wrote says. I'm going to show you what the Bible says. And I'm going to kind of give you um, my opinion on why the Bible doesn't answer some of these questions and why the Bible does answer some of these questions. But I think we can get a good idea about this. So the first question that a lot of people will ask in, in he, about heaven is, when we get to heaven, how old will we be? Look at 1 John chapter 3. Go to 1 John chapter 3. So people are always asking, how old will we be in heaven? In 1 John chapter number 3, the Bible kind of gives us uh, some detail about what things are going to be like, what we're going to be like. Um, in heaven in verse number two, but look at first John chapter three and verse number two The Bible says this it says beloved now we now are we the sons of God now You've been adopted into God's family if you're saved you are a lowercase s son of God or a daughter of God You've been adopted into his family. You are a child of God at this point beloved now We are the sons of God and it doth not appear what we shall be but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So, of course, I've preached extensively on the first resurrection, that, on that we're all going to be part of the first resurrection, and at that point we will have our glorified bodies. This is talking about um, Jesus coming back in his glorified body, and it's saying we are also going to have these glorified bodies after the first resurrection. So here's why. The answer is the Bible doesn't say how old you're going to be when you get to heaven. The Bible simply doesn't say. Next question. But I'm going to tell you why the Bible doesn't say. Because age, when you think about what people are asking when they, they ask how old am I going to be when I get to heaven, everyone in their mind has an ideal age of what they would like to be. And I'm sure that number is different for everybody. But just think about the idea of age, it's really, to answer the question, it's really a silly question. It's kind of an irrelevant question is what I'm showing you is because age is a function or a measure of your failing body. It's a function or measure of, of your, your dying self, you know, your physical flesh. And we're going to have glorified, perfect bodies when we are in heaven and we are in eternity. Even going into the millennial reign after the first resurrection, we are going to have glorified 
bodies. So it's really an irrelevant question. It, it, is age is just a measure of our remaining time on earth. Turn to James chapter 4. Age is just a measure of our remaining time on earth. Or it's a measure of what we think is our remaining time on earth. You know, you look at somebody who's older or what you think is older. You know, here's the thing. You think when you're 15, well, when you're 8, you think somebody that's 20 is old. Right? When you're, when you're 15, you think somebody that's 25 or 30 is old. All right? When you're 40, you think somebody that is 60 is old. And you, you start to kind of realize, oh, man, am I old? at that point, but it's just a relative measure of how much time you think you have left in this body on this earth. Look at James chapter 4 and verse 14. And I know we've read this verse before, but I just want to focus on the very beginning part of this verse. It says, whereas you know what shall be on the morrow. So here's the, here's the irony. How old you will be in heaven is irrelevant. And guess what? What James chapter 4 is saying in the very first part of this verse, you know, it says, what is your life? It is even a vapor. Talking about how quick your life goes by. But the first part of the verse, you know what the Bible is saying here? It's saying your age today is irrelevant. It's saying today that it, it, won't, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter how old you are today because you don't, like, the 15-year-old doesn't know what's tomorrow and the 90-year-old doesn't know what's tomorrow. So this is why we go out and we tell people that, you know, hey, you know, you should be more concerned about your salvation. Because you get this idea amongst the general population of people today that I'm young, I've got time. This is why young people, they go out and they do stupid things and they think that they're invincible and they think that nothing can ever happen to them. But the Bible is saying that's not the case at all. Because if you're 19, if you're 18, you don't know what's on the morrow. And if you're 100, you don't know what's on the morrow. You could die in five seconds no matter what age you are. And then the Bible is saying that whatever that time is, whether you have 20 years on this earth or you have 90 years on this earth, it's short either way, the Bible is saying. It's just a vapor. So we will not be children that are growing in heaven. We, we know that. But what is the, you know, and then people will ask, well, people really want to know what is the ideal age on earth because they want to be that age in heaven, which makes no sense because Anybody would have a different number. If I went and did a poll on, to this whole church on what is the ideal age that you would like to be forever, I guarantee you every single person will give a different number. You couldn't pay me a million dollars to be 20 again. A lot of people are like, oh, I want to be younger. You couldn't pay me every dollar in the world to be 20 again. I was a stupid idiot when I was 20. And I'm not ashamed to say it. I know a lot of like the 20-year-olds today, the 19-year-olds today, in, in this church and other churches like ours, they're a thousand miles ahead of where I was when I was 20 years old. So as hard as I am on you young people, just remember that. I was a stupid idiot when I was your age, and I'm not ashamed to say it, all right? But look, what's the ideal age? It doesn't even matter. I mean, if you ask me today, like, I'll take the wisdom over being 20, no problem, any, any day of the week. So anybody that really preaches a sermon or writes a book that says you're going to be this age when you're in heaven, they're just making stuff up. All right? They're just making up details that aren't there. It's an important note, and I've said this before many times, but it's an important note that when the Bible doesn't say, the Bible just doesn't say. You know, we can just, you know, we'll know when we get to heaven. But the point is, in the measure of eternity, in the measure of eternity, and in the glorified body that we're in that will never age, the Bible, I don't think the Bible says because it literally doesn't matter. It literally makes no difference how old you are. I mean, what if, what's even the measure of how you old you are in your glorified body? I mean, does it start like ticking at the resurrection or how does that work? You know, we can just ask Jesus those things when we get to heaven. Go back to Revelation chapter 21. So in the measure of eternity and the measure of what our glorified bodies are going to be versus what our bodies are now, age is just a, it's a measuring stick that we put on our mortal bodies. And we are not going to have mortal bodies. We're not going to be slowly dying in heaven. We're going to have glorified bodies. We're going to be eternal. Age is irrelevant. Revelation chapter 21, look at verse number one. The next question is, what will heaven be like? 
And that's what I really love about Revelation chapter 21 especially, is it kind of gives us the end state of heaven. After everything is done, after Jesus Christ has come back and has ruled and reigned for a thousand years with us, by the way, in our glorified bodies, we've been ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ for a thousand years. What will heaven, what will the eternal place for us to be, be like? Look at verse number one. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven, and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. That's kind of sad to me, because I like to fish. But number two is, but it won't be sad. We'll get to that in just a minute. And I saw, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and the God himself shall be with them and be their God. Look at verse number four. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. So look, you got to remember back in the millennial reign before the new heaven and the new earth, there were still people that were born and died. Not everybody was in their glorified bodies in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And I have pointed, you know, I've preached a whole sermon on that, but here, all that is going to be gone. There is going to be no more death. There's going to be no more, there's going to be no more opposition when you think about it that way. There's no more opposition to Jesus Christ, opposition to the saved. During the millennial reign, there was opposition. And you remember the devil was led out of hell and gathered everybody, and there was this final battle after the millennial reign of Christ, the battle of Gog and Magog. But all that is over in the new heaven and the new earth. Look at verse number five. It says, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. So this is the heaven, the place that God has prepared for us. So what is it going to be like? Look at Revelation chapter 22 and look at verse number 3. The first thing it says is that there will be no more death up there in Revelation chapter 21. It says there will be no more death. Let me turn there myself. I've got to turn back there. But look at Revelation chapter 22. And look at verse number 3. Revelation 22, 3 says, And there shall be no more curse. What is the curse? The curse was that which came upon creation, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. And we'll get to the last part of that verse. So look, there's no more dying. Again, why the concept of age is just completely irrelevant because no one is going to die in heaven. No one is going to age in heaven. So how old you are, it's like asking, you know, it's like saying, you know, what's two plus two and the answer is a banana or something. It just makes no sense at all, right? It's, it's, doesn't, it's an irrelevant concept in heaven. But look at this. Look at this in Revelation chapter uh, let me see. Let me go back here. Look at verse number 4 of Revelation chapter 21 one more time. So we're looking at what heaven is going to be like. It says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. That's number one. Neither sorrow nor crying. So the Bible is saying that there's going to be no sorrow in heaven. Now, that look, that's a kind of a hard concept to wrap your head around. If you just think about, you know, life today and the things that go on in just a regular life today. And the Bible is saying there's going to be none of that. There's going to be no crying, no sadness, no sorrow. You just think about just, I mean, just think about things that make you upset. Some people are upset all the time. You know people that are just upset all the time? You ever have a friend, you ever have a friend that, I used to have a friend that like I would never even want to ask him how he was doing. Because like it was just something bad all the time. And he was just the kind of person that no matter what was going on, bad or good, it was just bad. You know, like just, you just saw the bad in everything. And like you almost don't want to even say, how, how was your week? You know, because you don't, because he would just find something bad. And look, things weren't that bad for him. But he just was a very negative person. We've all met negative people. We've all, look, we've all been negative at times. But there will be none of this in heaven. You will not be upset anymore, ever, in heaven. That's what the Bible is saying here. That's a hard concept for us to wrap our heads around. But you will never be upset. You will have no more sorrow. Because look, if I got upset, like say I was a really positive person, which I hope that I am, but maybe I'm not as much as I should be. 
Say I'm super positive. I'm upset at times. Look, if you're, if you're on this earth right now and you never get upset, something is wrong with you. As a matter of fact, I don't want to preach a different sermon, but this is what they're trying to get you to do, is not be upset about anything. It's trying to just get you to accept everything. But there will be no more being upset because there will be no more evil. There will be literally no reason for anyone to ever be upset. I mean, it's, it's never going to happen. Think about people that are depressed. I mean, think about depression. You know how I like all-time highs and all-time lows? In our country today, I just went and I, re, I refreshed. This is one of those stats that I refresh every year when I bring it up in a sermon. And yep, it's getting worse. There's never been a time in our nation's history when more people are clinically depressed. And look, this is, this is staggering, by the way. This, is, this kind of shocked me. People today in the United States that are diagnosed with depression. Think about that. Diagnosed with depression, meaning they felt depressed. Look, we all feel depressed from time to time. Like you go on a vacation and then you have to go back to work and you have post-vacation depression. That's normal. Everybody's depressed from time to time. What I'm talking about is people that are just depressed so much, they literally called a doctor and they're like, I need to come in because I'm depressed. And then they go into a doctor and then they're diagnosed with depression. So they've gone down several steps. So like it's a, what I'm trying to get you to see is it's a major problem for them. It's like a real thing for them. You know what the percentage is? 29% of people in the United States are, are clinically diagnosed with depression. I mean, turn to Isaiah chapter 41. Turn to Isaiah chapter 41. Let's talk about this for just a couple of minutes. Isaiah chapter 41 and look at verse number 10. Look at Isaiah chapter 41. Look at verse number 10. So depression's a real problem today. This will not be in heaven at all. But it's hard to wrap your head around because look, any, any person, everybody at some point gets a little down, gets a little depressed. But look, the Bible even gives us the answer for depression. So the irony is, is the reason that there's no depression in heaven is kind of the same way we can get rid of depression here. Look at Isaiah chapter 41 and look at verse number 10. The Bible says this, it says, fear thou not, for I, look at, I mean, there's a word that just keeps popping up here in this verse. See if you can recognize the pattern. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Look what he says. He says, be not dismayed. You know what that means? Don't be depressed. And then he points out, what is the answer for depression? The, the Bible here is saying is, the answer for depression is the I in this verse. Who is the I? It's not me. It's not me, just because I read it. The verse is talking about the Lord, the Lord your God. The Lord your God is the answer for depression. So look, I mean, this is what, this is why our country is so depressed today. I'm just kind of given a general statement here is why. It's because they've left I. They've, they've left, they've turned their back on the I. In Isaiah 41, chapter, or verse number 10. They've turned their back on the Lord. Turn your back on the Lord more, you're going to be more depressed, United States of America. And you can just see it through all the stupid clown world policies that are being pushed by this nation. Look, you take a kid. You take a kid that should be happy. You take a kid that should be happy, should be playing, should be out there making pillows out of garbage bags and beating his friends. That's what, that's what kids should be doing and laughing and enjoying their life. You take that kid and then you just confuse them. You just confuse them about the most basic things about them. Instead of a father going to his son and saying to his son, son, I'm going to make a man out of you and I'm going to teach you how to do things and I'm going to teach you how to be a man and how to take care of your mother and how to take care of your sister and how to use tools and how to work hard and how to do all these things that the Bible, the Lord God says that you should know how to do as a man. Amen. Instead of doing those things that will build him up to be a joyful, strong Christian young man, let's confuse him about whether he even is a boy. And then he's depressed. It's a circus. And you can't even, I mean, you can't even believe that it's happening. 
And then you just confuse them and confuse them and confuse them for years. And then you wonder, like, man, they're, they're depressed and they're suicidal. What's happening? You left the Lord. That's what's happening. Right. Yep. It, I mean, it's not complicated. We're not building the space shuttle up here. I just explained why depression is eating this country up in two and a half minutes. In one verse from the Bible. Turn your back on, the, on, your, on God and what he tells you to do and what not to do. That's another thing. Sin, what will it do? It just, it'll, it'll eat you up and depress you. It'll tear you apart. Self-focus, which the Bible, which the Lord your God teaches against. You know, you're, you just focus on yourself more and more and more. I mean, just think about the idea of aging. Look, I am getting older. I understand. I look at a picture of my wedding, my wedding photo. I don't do this. But if I look at a picture of my wedding photo, and I've told my wife this, she looks the same, and you couldn't even tell that it was me. But who cares? Who cares? I mean, aging is just something that just whatever. I mean, it's, it's no big deal. I mean, I don't care. As long as she's with me, I'm good, right? Go back to Revelation chapter 21. There's no more depression in heaven. It's all gone. There's no more loneliness in heaven. You think about, that's another one. Everyone's lonely today. Loneliness is rampant. Nobody has any friends today, and they're just lonely. All of that is over in heaven. Look at Revelation chapter 21, verse number 10. What else is there about heaven? And there's several verses that talk about this next attribute of heaven. But first we see that there's no more death, there's no more sorrow, which means there's going to be nothing that upsets you, nothing that depresses you, nothing that makes you lonely or feel bad. There's going to be none of that. You can't even wrap your head around that. Because you literally need to be upset over things today. It is literally your Christian duty to protect your family, to be upset and pass judgment on evil today. You have to do that. It's just, I, I think, what I think is it's going to be like a load of bricks just lifted off of you. Because you're not going to have to be on your guard about everything. Like, every, I mean, isn't that true today? Don't you just have to be on your guard about everything today? As Satan and all his demons that, that run the show today are trying to teach you that evil is good and good is evil. I mean, you have to be constantly on your guard. Every letter you get in the mail, every phone call that you get is, how is this person trying to rip me off? You're constantly on your guard. Every single thing that they're trying to teach kids, whether it be in movies and cartoons and whatever, there's always some kind of angle where they're trying to, I mean, if you just get rid of all of it, it's easier. But there's always some kind of angle where they're trying to get you. They're trying to, trying to drag you into the mire. And it's, it's I think, this just can be like a, a load of bricks removed. You just don't have to worry about any of that anymore. There's going to be none of that anymore. There's going to be no being on your guard anymore. I mean, it's hard to even imagine, but it's going to be great. Look at verse number 10 of Revelation chapter number 21. What's the next thing about it? The next thing is that it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be so beautiful that it's hard to even imagine reading these verses. Look at verse 10. It says, he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Skip down to verse number 18. It says the building of the wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold. The streets were pure gold. It was pure gold, like unto clear glass. It says the foundations of the wall of the city were with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardis, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysophorus, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst. I mean, there's all these verses just, just describing the unbelievable beauty of heaven. It's, it's going to be beautiful. Now, look, I believe that beauty, this is another thing that they're trying to take away from you today. They're trying to take away what is beautiful today. But I believe that the reason, I mean, just think soul winning. So you go out soul winning, and I remember, 
I remember in, in Sacramento, one of the soul winning tips that Pastor Jimenez had was, you know, don't walk on people's lawns in, in Sacramento. Don't, you know, make sure you take the sidewalks. Don't walk on people's lawns. I don't really give that tip so much in Fresno because like there's just not a lot of people that take care of their lawns or there's not a lot of lawns here because it's so hot and whatever, but people just don't put as much effort into their lawn. But the point is this, a nice lawn looks nice. We all were stopped yesterday. I'm telling you, like all of us stopped, we were done soul winning and we stopped and we looked over at this yard and this yard had these, I don't even know what they were. They were like flowers, part flower, part cabbage or something, but they were all these weird, neat colors and they were placed in these great, and my wife took a picture and I'm like, I gotta find some of those. I like landscape. I like doing, I like making things look beautiful like that, but look, I don't care if you have a nice lawn, and this is a, a very superficial example, but I don't care if you have a nice lawn or you don't have a nice lawn. Nobody thinks that an overgrown lawn of thistles and weeds is beautiful. No one thinks that. But people, they go to a, a yard that is well-groomed and, and is symmetrical and orderly. And everyone, whether they have a yard like that or not, whether they've chosen to put that effort into that, everyone looks at that and says, that's beautiful. That's nice. I believe that's kind of written into us. What beauty is and what beauty isn't. Whether you have a spotless, clean house or not, I can't imagine that anybody enjoys just walking into a garbage pit for a house. Maybe they've just chosen to not, you know, to not put the effort into making it beautiful and orderly and clean. But the Bible says, you know, all things should be done decently and in order. We like order. It's in our conscience. We like it. But isn't the world trying to teach us that it doesn't matter? Well, you know, God cares what you look like, actually. I'm not talking about being you know, a good looking person or anything like that, but God cares what you wear. God cares um, what you put on your skin. God cares about all these things. And people are just trying to say like, hey, no, go on, just, just destroy your body. Just go and put a bunch of holes all over yourself and just brand yourself and just put tattoos from head to toe. I tell you what, I see a young lady with, with all these piercings all over her face, who's 16, 17, 18 years old, and just tattoos all over her neck and face, thinks she'll never be able to cover up, I feel sorry for her. Yeah. I feel sorry for her. I'm like, who lied to you? Who lied to you? Who led you? Where was your dad? Amen. Is what I think. I feel sorry for that. Look, there's certain things, but the world is trying to tell you, no, everything's beautiful. No, it's not. No, it's not. Just like it's trying to say that everything's good. No, some things are evil. Some things are evil. You see, you know, I mean, it's just, it's all the same thing, trying to teach us that evil is good and good is evil. Look, heaven is going to be beautiful. Heaven is going to be so beautiful that we will not, it's, it will be unimaginably beautiful. And I look forward to that. Turn to Revelation 22 now. So Revelation 21 shows us that heaven will have no death, no sorrow, no depression. You will never be upset. That weight of being on your guard, looking out for evil people. There will be no evil people there. It's only the people in the Lamb's Book of Life. What's the Lamb's Book of Life? Is that a different Book of Life? It's the Book of Life. I mean, it's not, we're not going to create some, you know, they use the Lamb's Book of Life instead of the Book of Life, and we'll create a whole new weird doctrine out of it. The Book of Life is the Book of Life. It's going to be all saved people in heaven. There will be no sin there. We will have glorified bodies. There'll be no death, no aging. Look at Revelation 22 and verse number 3. Here's a question. What will we be doing? What will we do all day? Look at Revelation 22 and verse number 3. Revelation 22 and verse number 3. The Bible says this. It says, There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants, that's you, shall serve Him. And they shall see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads. There's your mark right there. His name is going to be in your forehead. And that's why the, the mark of the beast is going to be in your forehead, because Satan just copies everything God does. Satan never has his own ideas. He copies things and changes it a little bit. You say this, so I'm going to be what, doing what? I'm going to be serving Jesus with my life in eternity. Turn to Matthew chapter 22. You say, is my wife going to be serving Jesus with me? 
How many people have you seen that write books and they say statements and they give notes to their wife saying, you know, I can't wait to, or, or you know, God forbid somebody's um, spouse has passed away and they're saying, well, I can't wait to go to heaven and spend eternity with my wife or spend eternity with my husband. Well, I've got some bad news for you here. We're going to look at what the Bible says. Look at verse number 23, or maybe good news for you. We'll see. Look at verse number 23. <laughs> There's going to be a bunch of ladies. Yes! <laughs> verse number 23 of Matthew chapter 22. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife. So we know this doctrine. This is kind of the, the thing that happened um, with, uh, with Ruth and, and Boaz. The, the nearest kinsman. His brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. So you have a man that dies, and now his wife is a widow, and she's got children, and it's, it's the duty of his brother, if he has a brother, or the nearest kinsman to marry this lady and ha, you know, raise a family with her. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, and under the seventh. So all these men just keep dying. I mean, this woman is very suspicious, first of all. Like, what is going on here? I think this, this uh, story's been in the news in the last few years. And the last of, the, and last of all, the woman died also. So what happens is they're, they're, trying to, like, they're trying to catch Jesus, right? They're trying to catch him with some, you know, um, extreme situation. And they're saying, all right, so this woman dies, or this woman is married to this guy. He's got seven brothers. And then he dies, and then she marries the brother. That brother dies, it marries the other brother. That brother dies, marries the other brother. So she's married all seven of these brothers. All right, she's been married to them all, and they all mysteriously die. All right, look at what the Bible says in verse 28. It says, therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. So all of these seven brothers were married to this girl, and they're saying, in heaven, who's she going to be married to? Aha! Gotcha! Because he'll never be able to answer this one. And look what Jesus says. Jesus answered and said, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are the, as the angels of God in heaven. So you're not married in heaven, is what the Bible is saying here. It's, you know, you're married on this earth. So guess what? Make the most of your marriage here is what you should do. And hopefully your wife isn't on her deathbed, you know, thanking God she's released from you at that point. You know, but it's a, it's a good measure if you think about it. Look, I've literally known people. I have literally known people, and maybe you have too, where, you know, they get older and they never, you know, they, and, and the woman just can't, she just can't wait for him to die. Just please, I've had enough. And, you know, that's a good measuring stick for us, I mean, you know, my, my thought is on this with, with my wife. I'm like, I, I know we're not going to be married in heaven, but, like, hopefully she lets me visit, you know? She let, she's pretty much going to be living on a, a, another part of town. I'm going to be the guy, like, on the south side of the railroad tracks, and then she's going to be in the nice part of town. Hopefully I can come over every now and then while we're serving Jesus. But um, it's a good measurement for us in our marriage that make the most of your marriage here because your marriage is for you on earth. Your marriage is for you. Pay attention to it. When? Now. Pay attention to it because you don't know what. You don't know if you're going to live another five seconds. You don't know if you're going to live. I don't care if you're 15 or you're not married when you're 15. I don't care if you're 20 or 30, but you don't know how long your marriage is going to be. You don't know when you are going to pass away or your wife is going to pass away and go to heaven. But when that happens... That's your marriage at that point. So please pay attention to your marriage now. You know, look at John chapter 14 and look at verse number 2. John chapter 14 and verse number 2. So I, I haven't mentioned rewards in heaven, but we know that we will have rewards in heaven. And even in Revelation chapter 22... I'll just read it for you. But Jesus literally says, he says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his work. In John 14, 2, the Bible says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Look, God is preparing heaven for us. 
He is preparing this place that the Bible gives us these great details on. But it's just, we, these details are such great details, we can't even really wrap our heads around these things. We, I have no experience at all with having a life of no sorrow. Of having a, a, a life with no sad feelings or no bad thoughts. I, I have no experience with that. Look, it's better... It's going to be better than anything we could possibly imagine. It is really all, you know, we should need to know. It's really anything we could possibly imagine or read even in the Bible. So, on that note, no one, no one should choose to go to hell. Because if people go to hell, they, they literally chose to go there, when you think about it that way. They made that decision. They said, you know, but many people, most people will choose. They will, just think about it. Think about it from that perspective. All the things we just learned about heaven, and people will choose to go to hell. My wife met a person the other day that said, that believed that when you die, you have seven minutes to choose between heaven and hell. And like, I mean, you kind of want to chuckle, but it's really kind of sad when you think about it that this person actually believed that. But if you have seven minutes, there will be no one in hell. If you have seven minutes to sit here and stare at, at this beautiful heaven, this beautiful place that God has prepared for us, and then seven minutes, I mean, you wouldn't need seven minutes, you'd need about a second to be like, I don't want to go there. You know, hell is not a place, hell is eternal suffering. We were talking about with the guys today, hell is not a place, you know, one of the guys had a bunch of friends, they're like, yeah, I'd rather be a ruler in hell. No one's going to be ruling in hell, they're all going to be screaming. All my friends are in hell. I want to go there. If you have a friend in hell, none of them want you there. They're all screaming for you to get saved so you can go to heaven. Amen. Right now they're doing that. That's what the man in hell said in Luke 16. At least when God told him, when Abraham told him, you can't get out. The last plea that he made was, please send somebody back to tell my family. Tell, to tell them. To, because why? Why? He didn't care about it. He knew that it was too late for him at that point. But what did he think about next? Everybody he used to know. He didn't want anyone that he used to know, his friends, his family, coming where he currently was, where he was currently stuck. For what? For eternity. It's the worst thing you could possibly imagine. So no, there's not seven minutes. It's, it's right now. In 2 Corinthians 6, this is where you know, Paul says, it says, now is the accepted time. He says, now, now, behold, now is the day of salvation. He's saying, th there's no seven minutes. So the choice, the decision, and where you put your trust, it must be done here. And it's an easy choice when you just look at all of these things that are in heaven. All of these things that are going to be so great that we can't even imagine what they're going to be like. But it's ironic that we're going to be doing what we were doing in heaven we're doing the exact same thing that we're supposed to be doing here, which is what? Serving Jesus. Amen. And heaven is going to be prepared greater. In, in, in Luke, he talks about how, you know, the guy that had ten talents gets ten cities. And Jesus in Revelation 22 and all over the Bible talks about how he's bringing his reward with him. The better you serve Jesus here, the better your eternity is going to be. So the better that you serve Christ in this moment, in this vapor, the better your eternity will be. Talk about like the best investment that you could ever make in your life. You're investing into your own eternity. So that's heaven. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.